Um, there are three people to go. First of them is uh, Ms. Lisa Beist. Uh, Lisa Beist is a, our Chief National Cyber Risk Officer at the Government Office at, and the Government Security Committee. Um, that committee, that the Government Security Committee, uh, um, analyzes and assesses the national security situation and uh, coordinates the activities of the authorities of executive power with regard to planning, development, and organization of national defense. Uh, and uh, without further ado, uh, Ms. Feist. Uh, thank you, Lauri, for such a kind introduction. And the scene could not be better set for what I'm about to say, which is the 10 hard, possibly naked truths of what cyberspace is like. The 2020 COVID-19 edition. Uh, bringing together the Estonian national landscape picture that colleagues already shared and the international perspective that Heli Dirmaklar just addressed. Uh, and I do it in the shape of 10 hard truths in 10 minutes, which I'll happily elaborate on, whether it's in further questions or on online platforms. Uh, first of all, the first hard truth to accept is that cyber attacks will always take place and there's no 100% security. That is simply the cost of the highly digital lives most societies around the world have chosen to live. And it's a cost that we'll have to accept if we want to enjoy the fruits of electronic life. So we'll always see criminals, Networks, including important essential national networks, will see network sc scans, will see politically motivated attacks, and most definitely those are integrated into other modern forms of asserting power over nations, particularly by those who don't share our values or are not necessarily rule of law based. Second hard and inconvenient truth is that Geopolitics are hard to change. And you know, Estonia, as well as, as others in this part of the world, know that. But similarly, the pandemic has highlighted the increasingly internationally, some would call it aggressive, others would call it present, uh, China. Uh, we've seen that with the pandemic itself, but there's a few things where China clearly has learned from the Russian playbook. As the pandemic was spread over the world, few noticed the piece of news that Huawei, the Chinese telecoms giant, presented a concept paper on a new IP, a fundamentally different way of organizing the very backbone of our online digital space, how traffic is routed to the International Telecommunications Union, a UN subbody that is to discuss this later in the year. Uh, critics have already said that it's likely to uh, to raise serious privacy concerns and concerns about unsanctioned listening or possibilities to do so by governments. But after all, as uh, the previous speaker uh, pointed out, framing the space we live in internationally and framing what tomorrow's digital space looks like. Similarly, several Asia Pacific nations including Australia, were attacked by the Chinese APT Nikon and their uh, malware that was clearly targeting and spreading between government institutions in the target nations. Again, something that shouldn't really surprise us and simply says that governments assert influence in this domain just like they do in others. Uh, what we know about those government-backed government-controlled often attackers is that they're opportunistic and reactive. In other words, they use all and any tools and they use all and any opportunity. And there's a few other chances where a single issue, 
and a single question, such as the global uh, pandemic, frames the global conversations and frames the way the global, uh, the global population lives and the way the developed world works. So it would be insane to assume that suddenly they're not doing that in cyberspace during a pandemic. You know, mixing that with geopolitics, of course, the not rule of rule of law based politically motivated attacker would take advantage of the pandemic to try to delegitimize rule of law based nations uh, and you know take a, try to use the pandemic for spear phishing, which was seen across the Western world against government agencies. But frankly, they would use any chance. Corona was just convenient. Um, fourthly, spies are going to spy. Uh, and the intelligence communities across the world, both those that are friends and allies and those who aren't, have continued to gather information and the pandemic has presented for them a new domain to work in, the medical sector possibly, and that has also opened a new possible attack sector. Uh, but it's nothing new, it's up taking opportunistic advantage of the global situation. Uh, similarly, we know that the politically motivated actor in cyberspace is both resourceful and patient. And that's been demonstrated to the greatest degree in the 2016 electoral campaigns, where it's well documented that the attacker laid low in the networks of the victims' organizations for months and months. And of course, the same resourceful and patient uh, uh, actor has been reported to be trying to dabble in IP theft in figuring out uh, what the art, state of the art of research and development is when it comes to the pandemic. New area, same actors, same tools. Uh, so it's simply in the international space spells APT the way APT has been spelled, advanced persistent threat the politically backed, government-supported or control controlled cyber attack groupings. Uh, what's similarly been seen across the world is disinformation that's connected to the coronavirus. Very similarly connected with uh, cyber campaigns, but in its essence, uh, nothing new. The inevitable fact that we'll have to accept. Number seven is that vulnerabilities will happen. And by the virtue of the way software and hardware are built from components, vulnerabilities will always happen. Now, if there's a major zero day in a smart device operating system that's dominant across the world, as was alleged about a month and a half ago, at the time when a large part of the global population is working from home using the devices of the said provider, that of course potentially has a big impact. But again, not pandemic specific. Number eight, medical technology is particularly vulnerable. And knock on wood, it's safe to say that my biggest fear of medical technology being at, taken advantage of in a sector where the patch cycles are notoriously long, there's plenty of vulnerabilities where the vulnerability registration number starts with a 1-9, meaning the year it was first spotted in the wild started with 1-9, the last century. That number is still surprisingly large. Um, factor number nine is uh, remote work. It's clear that, again, the Western global population, uh, as much as possible, was working remotely and in many cases transitioned to remote work quickly, which means that there's reports of increased 
attacks against uh, virtual private networks, VPNs. There's reports of increased uh, attacks and vulnerabilities in teleconferencing platforms. But those, to a great degree, correlate with increased use of those tools. So all in all, to a great degree, it's been business and, as usual with a, a single focusing a, agenda item where the real danger, as Raul Rick mentioned when talking about telecommunications, is the danger of weaponization of these issues at a time of crisis. And that's what we're to look out for. So with that, the naked inconvenient truth is that it's been business as usual on the global cyber scale with a new flavor sprinkled on top during the global pandemic. And I'm happy to take questions either here or later on online. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Um, I will have a question for you. So we have seen uh, some of this APT activity um, during this pandemic. Uh, and As we have seen for about a decade on a Hello. regular basis. And uh, the, the change here is that uh, some new cases use the COVID-19 as a lure. Some go after new newer targets, but, you know, we still see them. Somehow we know about some of these activities, um, even though one of our commentators pointed out that attribution continues to be elusive, but the private sector, you know, happily attributes to uh, some of these activities to APT's um, states take longer, fine. But could you uh, tell us or, or um, uh, elaborate on whether the type of public attribution of cyber operations actually change the behavior of these different APT groups or are we just doing this, you know, in vain? So that's the million dollar question. Does attribution create deterrence? And the simple answer is that not by itself but it creates the first step of deterrence. By attribution, you're doing a few things. Uh, you're first of all pointing a finger. Now, finger pointing itself only works for those who are capable of shaming. Naming and shaming someone who's not capable of shame, such as intelligence organizations of totalitarian states, is um, as useful as a chocolate teapot. Uh, but first of all, it gives you the basis in international law in certain cases for countermeasures, which is fundamental that you, we ourselves can then abide by the rules that we've agreed internationally. And it has signaling value. I mean, you know, of course, no one thinks that by the indictment of the, I believe, 13 Russian intelligence operatives that were behind the Democratic National Committee hacks that, you know, they look at the indictment and stop doing what they're doing out of Moscow. But it says, hey, we see what you're doing. And it also signals that we won't stand for it. So that's important. You're, of course, right that attribution as a political step in international relations can take time. Uh, you know, the Bundestag attacks of five years ago were officially attributed a few weeks ago, rather inconvenient as a basis for countermeasures. Uh, however, as was mentioned earlier today, attributing and collectively attributing uh, defacement of Georgian websites, government-related websites, last October happened earlier this year. So that's something where as an international community we realized that five years might not be optimal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and. Uh...